Can we just take a moment and pray together? Can we just do that? Let's, let's ask the Lord's blessing on our time as we share. Father, we ask today that you would be honored by the speaking of your word. And Father, in my frail attempts, I pray that you would take what is, what is spoken and that you would multiply it, bless it, and use it for the building of your kingdom, the strengthening of the saints. And may everything that we seek to do bring glory to your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so go with me to, whether on your device or if you brought your Bible along with you, go, go with me to Psalm chapter 90. And this particular psalm is the only recorded psalm written by Moses. And uh, some have tried to discredit this as being the Moses, but most would suggest that this is the Moses who led nearly two million people out of Egypt. So we have to think this, you gotta think about this, having led a number of different organizations, just the impact that that would have had on, on him in his, in, his, in his thinking, in his work, in his just everything in leadership. Walking nearly up to two million people out of Egypt into the wilderness. Just the magnitude of that thought is amazing, right? I mean, you talk about herding cats, right? I mean, you've tried to lead a small number of people, right? Anybody tried to lead, you know, like if you're in a classroom, like a preschool class or maybe a, 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 um, a Sunday school class or maybe a, a birthday event or something, you're trying to get everybody on the same page so that we can learn together or we can have a game to get to something, right? And you know what it's like to get, you know, five or 10 people on the same page to do the same thing. He had two million. Put that, I mean, up to, think about it. I don't care if it was 100,000, but there was a lot of people that were walking. They weren't driving. They weren't in any kind of mechanized units of any sort. They were walking for the most part. That's a leader. And this man that's writing in this particular passage has a, a, had an enormous task that was set before him. But he knew, listen to me, he knew the God that he served. And in this writing, in this passage of Scripture, as you read it, as you study it, you begin to have a greater appreciation, not just for his leadership, not just for his ability to command people, but for his understanding and love of God. And you read these first two verses, read them there with me, where it says this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Notice the next verse. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, now get this, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In this 90th Psalm, again, the only one written by Moses, we see this man writing from a human perspective of his knowledge and his experience of God. How easy it is for me as an individual, as a human as well, confined by this human experience to be consumed by my own existence. That I forget to put my understanding of life into context. In the context of God's eternal nature and my very, very limited existence. In the context of God's holiness and my very, very sinful nature. All of a sudden, I am forced into a juxtaposed choice of existence. Continue living in a state of ignorant turmoil, or two, surrender my life with all of its frailty, with all of its sin, to an eternal God who can make something out of nothing. 
May this prayer of Moses be our understanding and in part our prayer to keep our dependence and focus on God every day. Every day. I like what Moses does because Moses starts really big, right? And you know, sometimes we talk about from everlasting to everlasting, like we really understand that. And as I read this passage again, I read that from everlasting to ever. What in the world does that even mean? From you say it like you really mean it, but you. But for me, I don't even know what I mean, right? So I'm saying from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And then I begin to dig in. What does it really mean from everlasting? Because Moses starts really big. He he wants his he wants his reader to understand this God that he's writing about. And so he says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And what you begin to understand is, is that Moses realizes he's confined by time and space. And that God is not confined by time and space. So from everlasting, so from everything that has been He says this, before the mountains were born, before the earth was formed, even before the reality of all that we know, from everlasting, and then on the other side, to everything that is yet to come and beyond, to everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Wow. He wants his readers to understand the magnitude of who God is. And you and I, it's so easy for us to, you know, just in passing, in our prayers, just to say the name of God without really taking into consideration this God that we serve. This God that we claim to know. And so in the very first verse, we find that he's talking about an eternal God refuge and protector. If you look in that first verse again, though, something very interesting that he wants the reader to know, you have been our dwelling place for all. The Israelites didn't have a dwelling place. They didn't have a place to call home. So if you were reading this in that context, you could, you could understand. Now, most of us have a home to go back to, Right? Now, we're living, many of you are living in a res hall, so that may be a temporary home. But for most of us, we have a place that we call home, a place to go back to. And so we don't often think about those who don't have a home. In this case, the Israelites didn't have a place that they could call their own. And so what he is saying in this passage is, look, you have been our dwelling place. You have been the one that we are able to to consume us. The psalm begins with a great affirmation concerning the relation of man to God, addressing him as Elohim, not addressing him as Elohim, the mighty one, or Jehovah, the helper, but as Adonai, the sovereign Lord. The singer declares that he has been the dwelling place, the habitation, the home of man in all generations. You are everything that we need, is what Moses was saying. You are everything, even though we do not possess it. They had no place to call their own. But Moses recognizes that God is their everything, not only for now, so not only for the time that he was writing and not for the times previous, but for all generations. From everlasting to everlasting, before anything ever existed, God was. From eternity past to eternity future, everything, everlasting to everlasting. He exists independent of all creation. Adam Clark noted this. To say everlasting to everlasting is the highest description of the eternity of God to which human language can reach. To understand that, even just at at the smallest amount of understanding. To understand that, to begin to understand that. Everlasting to everlasting. Before the mountains were born, 
before the earth was formed. The expanse of God's existence is beyond my ability to comprehend. Our finite minds cannot begin to understand the existence of an eternal God. We cannot. And here's, here's the reason why Moses wants us to understand this. You can't appreciate what God is doing in your life, right? Because sometimes we think of God as that distant being, right? And in our sinfulness, we have been separated from God. But God in his expanse being, and this thing that's beyond us to understand, literally comes and works in our lives. Literally works in my life. You see, what I find is man in sin has made a mess of things, right? Did I put, did I put you all to sleep? All right, let's try that again. In our sin, we've made a mess of things. And I've made a mess of things just because. You just ask my wife. She will tell you quickly that I can make a mess of things really quick. Right? And you've probably made a mess of things doing something in your life, right? Um, I, I'm not a mechanic. I've tried. I grew up on a farm, and I try. And it seems like every time I try to fix something, I, I make it worse. My, my brother received all the mechanical skills, and so you can give him a task, and he can make it run. Even if it was running halfway, by the time I get done, it's not running at all. And um, I, I have, I have a, 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 a gift at stripping bolts out. If you don't know what I mean, it's just, yep, <laughs> just my reality. I'm not, I'm not extremely mechanical, um, just not my gifting, right? I can make a mess. I, I always say that plumbing was designed to start here and to end out there somewhere. Now, the rest of you that are keen at doing those things and understand how to do plumbing, but for me, I always start in one place and I end up somewhere else trying to fix something that... I had, this, I had this great idea, I'll just, I'll just be a little transparent here, I had this great idea. <clears throat> so we were living in Northern Ohio, and our pipes froze, right? So freezing pipes means that you have ice inside your pipe and it's not letting the water go through. And in order to fix that, you need what? Heat, heat right? Yeah. Oh, come on, <laughs> hang with me for a moment. You need heat to melt the ice. So I had a, a blowtorch. Yeah. See, now, now you get the picture of why I say that the mechanical things probably should not be left to me. So I get under my house and strike up the, the torch, and, and I, I, was, I was thinking, I'm not really as, as ignorant as I'm letting on here. It's a, a bit manufactured, but just go with me because this is really what I did. I, I didn't move it fast enough. They said, you got to keep it moving fast. got to keep it moving fast. And I didn't keep it moving fast enough. And next thing I knew, I, there was water going everywhere. And, and I was, it was cold outside, and I'm drenched in, in, in water, and it's freezing on me. And yeah, so I can make a mess of things really quick, right? And uh, I'm not bragging about that, by the way. Just, 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 just know. But sin, sin in our life, we make a mess of things, right? Ignoring God's plan, ignoring God's will for our lives. He literally points this out a little bit later. He says, there's the open sins and there's the private sins and God knows them all. Did you get that? There's the open sins, what people can see, and there's the private sins that nobody can see, but God, God sees them all. God understands. God knows. Sins made a mess of things. So we do not understand the full blessedness of believing that our God is an asylum until we understand that he's our asylum from all that is destructive. McLaren said this. Nor do we know the significance of the universal experience of decay and death until we learn that it is not the result of our finite being, but the result of our sin. You see, sin will make a mess of things. And, and, and the psalmist here, it recognizes that. right? Not just the expanse of God, but... There's our sinfulness to contend with, to understand. And we put that in, 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 into an understanding that here is God and here is me. So why would God want to do anything in relationship to me? Because I've made a mess of everything. 
But notice this. Notice this. Man with God's blessing can fulfill God's established plan. He says these words in this, in, this, in, this, in this passage as well. He says, teach us to number our days. Right? And I know it's easy sometimes to think that, especially for those of you that are younger, that we're, we're just going to be here forever, right? We're pretty indestructible. I was at 18. Yeah. I mean, we, we feel that way. We don't understand that life is, is short, even at its very, very longest. And when you think about the expanse of God and you think about the small amount of time that we're going to be here, sometimes you can become dis, disenchanted with life and say, well, why does what I do matter? Why, why does what I do matter? Why does the amount of money that I give or why does the amount of time that I spend or why does the prayers that I offer, why do those things matter? Right? It's, it's easy to question ourselves Teach us to number our days for what purpose? That we might gain wisdom, understanding. That we can learn the necessity of depending on God. And here's what I would say to you. God knows you. God knows me. God understands you. God understands me. God seeks to bless you. God seeks to work in your life. And so at the very end of this passage of Scripture, Moses prays for four things. Can I share those with you? Four things he says. First, he says, return, Lord. Return. Because Moses is calling for the presence of God. He's saying, look, in the presence of God, you're going to find two things. The first thing you're going to find is compassion. The second thing you're going to find is mercy. Compassion and mercy. And then he says, make us glad. You say, why is that important to be made glad? Because you can only understand gladness if you've ever experienced fear and sorrow, right? If you've experienced fear and sorrow, then to be made glad, you appreciate, you understand. It means something to me. In my sorrow and in my pain and my hurt, I can't fully understand, I can't fully appreciate gladness until it's experienced through God. And then it comes and I feel it and I experience it. And because of that sadness and pain, when I experience gladness, I can appreciate it. Then he says, let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. So what does that mean? This can only be understood in the context of difficult times, contrasted with the presence of God in the midst of that. He wants us to experience his presence in our lives. And then here's the last thing he says. He says, establish, he says it twice actually, establish the work of our hands. Establish the work of my hands. So here's a great God. Here's the expanse of time. Here's all that God has to offer, right? Here's a great God that you wonder, does he even care? And Moses said, oh yes, he does. He does care. And in his presence, we can experience what he has in full. And then he says, establish, establish the work of our hands. Take even the smallest thing, Lord. I remember reading in Matthew chapter 10. He says, not even a sparrow falls from the sky. Even the hairs on your head are numbered. If you think he doesn't care about the details, he does. And he demonstrates that through his word and through his presence as he seeks to be with us each and every day. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in this passage, Moses, in a human attempt to help us understand the expanse of God, the eternity of God, from everlasting to everlasting. I pray today, God, that you would help us to grasp that, but then not to forget quickly that you care about us as an institution. You care about us as individuals. And so we pray this day that you would teach us to number our days, that we may grow in wisdom, and that you would bless, establish the work of our hands. And may everything that we seek to do today and the days to come 
May it bring glory to your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And everybody said,